On the eve of the Civil War, woman, historically silenced by society, began to verbally attack the institution of slavery in the United States. After witnessing change, women began to realize that they could influence more than just the abolitionist movement. They could impact future generations through the voting process. As a result, women's suffrage movement began. Before the Civil War, language which specifically described voters as male did not appear in the federal constitution. But like 20 other states, the constitution in Illinois gave the vote only to white male inhabitants above the age of 21, but excluded women from using the ballot. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony began to address this issue by holding discussions throughout the nation inspiring the women of Illinois, a turning point in history. Kate Doggett, Mary Livermore, and Myra Bradwell responded and the Chicago Cirrhosis Club was formed. Almost upon its founding in 1868, the club became divided. Should they concentrate on securing women's rights alone, or should they promote universal suffrage that included black suffrage, the rejection of property requirements, or the elimination of education requirements for voting. This broad array of issues split the club and the national suffrage movement. An united effort for suffrage nearly disappeared in February 1869 when both sides held women's suffrage conventions. In order to convince the Illinois Constitutional Convention to include universal suffrage in the proposed document, Frances Elizabeth Willard, along with other members of the newly formed Illinois Women's Suffrage Association, traveled to Springfield in February of 1870. The idea that boys of 21 are fit to make laws for their mothers is an insult to everyone. After Willard left town, the voice of opposition was also heard. A petition from 380 Peoria women protested that they were having the ballot thrust upon them. It was also sent to the General Assembly. In May, the Illinois Convention followed the example set by the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and drafted a document that provided suffrage for all adult males, but not women. It would be two decades before real movement was realized. The first step towards voting rights took place in 1891 when Illinois women received the right to vote in school elections. Catherine Waugh, an attorney from Evanston, took this opportunity to revitalize the movement by suggesting a new name, the Illinois Equal Suffrage Association, IESA. Members of the IESA realized that they faced a major challenge, changing society's impression of women. A member of a group called Man Suffrage Association sent a letter of opposition to a state senator. The writer claimed, Women had done nothing to deserve the vote. They were merely the passive and often unwilling hostile instrument by which humanity is created. This sentiment existed in many circles, circles that also included women. As the movement pressed forward, Many bills were proposed that asked for women's inclusion in the presidential elections. Part of the reason that these bills did not pass was because many believed that women would vote dry and further the anti-alcohol movement. During a women's suffrage meeting at the University YMCA in Urbana, Mayor F. H. Boggs declared that if females were elected to public offices, they would better enforce laws than male mayors, bootlegging joints in the county seat would be closed, and that all laws would be enforced to the letter. His words offered support to both sides of the suffrage movement. Voices of the Equal Voting Movement included that of Maurice Wormser, an assistant professor of law at the University of Illinois. He argued that our government is not by the people when we exclude women. The traditional role of womanhood was challenged during the struggle for voting rights. O.B. Dobbins, 
who later became mayor of Champaign, argued that real women do not want to vote. Only mannish women do so. In 1912, Grace Wilbur Trout, president of the Chicago Political Equality League, suggested a change in tactics. Instead of being confrontational, they created local organizations in every senatorial district. In 1913, first-term Speaker of the House, Democrat Champ Clark, notified Trout that he would support new legislation if she could prove that there was support for the bill in Illinois. Trout called upon the local organizations to pressure lawmakers. While in Chicago over the weekend, Speaker Clark received constant phone calls, possibly influencing his thoughts on the issue. When Clark returned to Springfield, telegrams and letters favoring suffrage flowed into his office. Voting rights in Illinois required supporters to act quietly and quickly to catch the opposition off guard. After passing the Senate, the bill was brought up for a vote in the House on June 11, 1913. Trout and her team counted heads and went as far as to call male voters to leave their homes and come to the Capitol. Watching the door to the House chambers, Trout pleaded with supporters not to leave before the vote, while also trying to prevent anti-lobbyists from illegally being allowed onto the House floor. The bill passed with six votes to spare. On June 26, 1913, the governor signed the bill in the presence of Trout, Booth, and union labor leader Margaret Healy. Although Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Washington, and California had already given frontier women voting rights, Illinois became the first state east of the Mississippi to give voting power to women, or at least partial voting rights. Besides the passage of the Illinois Municipal Voting Act, 1913 was an important year in the women's suffrage movement. In Chicago, African-American anti-lynching crusader Ida B. Wells Barnett founded the Alpha Suffrage Club for Black Women of Illinois. Although white women were not united on the issue of voting rights, African-American women were almost universally in favor of gaining the vote. They believed that voting power would help end sexual exploitation, promote educational opportunities, and protect the female wage earners. Carrie Chapman Catt wrote, The effect of this victory upon the nation was astounding. When the first Illinois election took place in April of 1914, the press carried the headlines that 250,000 women had voted in Chicago. Illinois, with its large electoral vote of 29, proved the turning point that women were gaining genuine political power. The stage was set for the 1916 presidential election. Illinois recorded nearly 2.2 million people casting ballots, an increase of more than a million over the 1912 election. To the dismay of many, there was little difference in the presidential vote by gender. Statewide, Republican candidate Charles Evans Hughes got 52.7% of the male vote and 52.4% of the female vote, while President Wilson received 43% of the male vote and 43.7% of the women. The most interesting result was the prohibition ticket. Although women were more likely to vote to outlaw alcohol, Fewer than 26,000 of the 2.2 million votes cast in Illinois supported the ban on liquor, proving that women were not single-issue voters. The momentum of the suffrage movement continued to grow. Political lobbying, parades, rallies, discussions did not cease until American women were granted the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1920, a true turning point in history. The suffrage movement did not end in 1920, but rather flowed beyond the borders of the United States. Despite great strides, women around the world continue to face discrimination almost a century later. Females are still refused access to education, political participation, and suffrage. Striving for women's empowerment and gender equality continues. Protecting the rights and improving the lives of women and girls around the globe, a turning point for the future. <laughs>